Lani, it is uh, probably good afternoon there, and it is practically <coughs> one hour to go for midnight in India, Mumbai. So I'm flying across to El Paso, Texas. That's where you are, Lani. All right. Yes, yes. Uh, I, grew up, here. I grew up uh, reading those days about the gunslingers uh, in Texas and the gunfights and El Paso. Uh, I grew up reading all those things and uh, oh, things are uh, quite different probably in Texas now. So uh, anyway. Well, well, they are, but some things don't change very much. There's a Years ago, very few people heard about El Paso. Now it's a, a big thriving community. It's over a million people. But uh, years ago, the thing that popularized El Paso was a song by a guy named Marty Robbins. Uh -huh. and it was called Rosa's Cantina. Oh. And it's about this guy who's in love with this girl. And it's a sad song. But uh, anyway, just about everybody heard about Rosa's Cantina. Well, Rosa's Cantina is about two or three miles from my house. Mm -hmm. It's a real place, and uh, and they serve a great lunch over there. So if you if you come to El Paso, we'll go to Rosa's Cantina, and you'll be able to. Welcome, to welcome, welcome. Uh, I just promised oh. uh, uh, a European tour. Probably from there, I move over to uh, Texas. I have a lot of friends around there. So uh, yeah, the order of, uh, change, but things stay the same as well. So, Lani, uh, I mean, it's a real honor that. Uh, you know, after a couple of interactions, and then, uh, as a matter of fact, Colleen uh, told me that uh, <laughs> don't talk for three hours with Lani because <laughs> both of you got so much in common that you're going to take three hours of recording. As you know, I will hold my horses, and then this is, I left to Lani to steer up and gallop the way he wants to. So let me just introduce you as a formality since I have to. I'm sorry, this always happened to me. There we go. Now, that's not uh, much of me talking. It's all you talking, OK, right? So although I put interaction, but uh, it'll be fun uh, to have you. And uh, thanks again, formally, to being here with me and uh, looking forward to this. You're on the 17th episode. And this episode started uh, somewhere around in September, more because of the Pendabig, because I am a Gamba guy and uh, I did not know what to do after I came back from Paris. So uh, January 2020, we were struck by COVID. I could read a couple of books, but then I got fed up. So somewhere around last, somewhere around September 2021, I've been hearing a lot of podcasts, etc. So I said, let me start one. So then I, fortunately, I uh, came across Mark Deluzio, who is now a mentor to me. And he's the gentleman who changed my name from Dr. Mohan to Dr. M. And I remain as Dr. M on LinkedIn, thanks to Mark Deluzio. So uh, it was more of a curiosity since I've been in this for the last 20 years. As a matter of fact, it goes back to 1990, but cutting it short uh, is my sensei, Sensei Masaki Mai. And one of the things that I noticed and we were talking about is the support and sustenance of continuous improvement process, irrespective of which path we take, whether the Kaizen path, the Lean path, Toyota production system, Six Sigma, and you can add whatever adjectives you want to that. But the whole problem is that how do you support and sustain it? You know, this is one of the issues, and that's why I started this series. And this is the 17th, uh, you are on the 17th series. You're going to be there for another four or five more episodes with me. I, you're going to leave yeah. that fast. Okay, so this is, <laughs> sorry for this. <laughs> so uh, uh, when we were talking in a prep meeting and you said, uh, and I read these two articles of yours in your post, Change Agents, are you weird enough? So I said, uh, let's talk about it. And then I said, uh, <laughs> it is Lani who's going to talk about it and I'm going to be the weird guy who's going to duck. And that's what I really do in doing. I'm going to duck. And you're going to tell me why the change. 
Teenage agent, are you weird enough, right? So I can't stop talking after I put this image. That's honestly me without my glasses on. <laughs> so there you are, you have the uh, quality consultant. I went through the website, an amazing website and the number of books you have written, I think around six. And uh, Chevron, yes, we have been interacting with each other when you uh, were doing a promo for, uh, yeah, of course, uh, all of us know that you are a chemical engineer and and your activities in Chevron and the refinery. Chevron is a refinery, if I'm not uh, mistaken, right? Pardon? Chevron is a, a refinery, oil refinery. Well, Chevron's a fully integrated oil company. They uh, Their biggest business is in exploration and production, mm -hmm. but they have refineries, they have marketing, they have the whole shoot and match. Mm -hmm. My dad was in Shell. He was uh, a petroleum guy. Uh, he was, of course, in sales. Those days, it was called Burma Shell in India. Yeah, Shell is huge. They're, they're worldwide. They're more worldwide than Chevron is. But uh, in the States, Chevron is just huge. They're an incredibly large company. So there you have uh, being an engineering, a chemical engineer. And uh, this is the book that I fell in love with. And uh, this is the promo that I attended with you, and I still keep it very close to me. Here you are. I love this book, especially the first chapter is so amazing uh, of the Kaizen mindset. And these are the oh, various books that you have written. And uh, this is the Chinese uh, uh, version of this episode, right? Uh, I can't read Chinese. So it's lean manufacturing in Chinese here. I can't read Chinese either, but uh, it was being used in the industrial engineering program at uh, Beijing University. Mm -hmm. And then they, in conjunction with McGraw-Hill, translated it into Chinese. And um, so now there's a Chinese version of my book out there. And you were telling me last time that this book of your sustaining workforce engagement has become literally a textbook in certain universities in the U.S.? College. Yes. Yeah, that book and, and how to implement lean manufacturing both have been used in several colleges. Uh, how to implement lean manufacturing at one time or another was used at 17 different colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. Sustaining workforce engagement, I know of it's being used at three right now, mm -hmm. um, which which makes me very proud. It's 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 written like a textbook. It's it's deep, it's thorough, it's well researched. Um, and it and it paints engagement in in terms that allow the actual people in the field who are going to implement it to understand it. Mm -hmm. There's tons of stuff in the literature about engagement, but it's mostly written by academics, mm -hmm. and it's incredibly difficult to sort through all of the academic jargon and and actually apply it. Mm -hmm. The point of of me writing this book was to make turn the the, the complex and complicated science of the of the uh, psychologists and sociologists into everyday language that the the average manager in the plant can understand and utilize. Mm -hmm. And uh, of, of that book, I'm, I'm immensely proud. A lot of research went into that book, a lot. Well, thank you very much for that. And I'm sure I'm going to get hold of that because I uh, have gone through this book, uh, which uh, of uh, enlarging your footprints and uh, the flow was so good that I read it at least twice already. Oh, Especially the first okay, chapter you. on mindset was amazing. I really liked it. So uh, since we have to talk, I'm going back to this, okay? And I, I know I'm, it's probably uh, in India, uh, it is uh, after 30 minutes, I am into Thursday. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to duck over here and hand it over to you, <laughs> and let's hear from you uh, about the change engine and the question that you have asked is: Are you weird enough? Implying there where the change agent have to be weird, sir. Am I right? 
concluding that. Oh, yes, yes, you do. You have to be a little bit weird to be a change agent. Uh, not so much to to uh, to be weird in a general sense, but you need to be weird relative to your culture. Because when, when you find out people who fit in well to their culture, um, usually they're people who do the things that the culture wants to have done and is, is currently doing. Um, but the unfortunate truth of it is, if you're going to improve your culture, you need to change it. And as soon as you start to change things, uh, people view you a little bit differently. Um, let's hear and more. ultimately, Lani, let's hear more about it. And I'm going to stop sharing and it's over to you. Okay, okay, very good. Um, and so what happens is you need to have a little bit of weirdness in order to change the culture. You need to, to provoke people, you need to prod them, you need to poke them, you need to be able to show them that, that things need to be changed in the business. Uh, and sometimes they don't like to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit, little bit like telling a mother that she's got an ugly baby. You know, these people, these people have developed this system and sometimes they're very proud of it. Sometimes in having developed it, they've gotten huge promotions and raises and it's, it's been incredibly satisfying to them. And now somebody comes along and says, hey, we've got to change this. And um, so you can meet an awful lot of resistance as you try to change sometimes seemingly simple things. Um, but if you could present a, a decent case, usually you can get and by a case, I mean a business case, uh, usually you can get somebody's attention. Okay? Um, but you, you've got to be careful. And, and this weirdness has limits to it. Okay? Mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the bottom end, if you're not weird enough, you won't cause any change at all. And then as a change agent, you'll be ineffective. On the other end, if you're too weird, if you push the organization too far, beyond its comfort zone uh, and, and sometimes beyond what it's capable of doing, then you're just too weird and you're rejected by the culture. And in that case, you're not effective either. Okay. So um, if I could share my screen. Um, sure. I wrote, I wrote two articles and this is, Part of the second one. Can you see that, Dr. M? The uh, yes, this is the part okay. of the second one. Yes. Perceived view um, index. Yeah. And and um, a fellow by the name of uh, John O'Hannafin, mm -hmm. who uh, belonged to the Cleveland Gestalt Institute, um, they did some, some really uh, innovative work. Uh, came up with this term, the perceived weirdness index. Mm -hmm. and, and what he said was that uh, if you want to be effective in your organization, you have to have a little weirdness. Mm -hmm. You have to be weird enough to cause change to occur, but not too weird to be rejected. Mm -hmm. And so he, he called that the effectiveness range. And, mm -hmm. and here's the effectiveness range. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, if, if you get if you're if you're not effective enough, okay, you just get absorbed in the culture. You're just another person who's talking about the same things in the same way at the same time and the same levels. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're not going to be an effective change agent. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. if you're too weird, if you try to push the culture too hard, okay, uh -huh. then you get rejected. Okay. And again, you won't be an effective way change agent. Mm -hmm. So as a change agent, you need to be weird but not too weird. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the, the danger of it gets to be, um, if you are a change agent like myself or yourself, there's a lot of things you can go into a business and help them with. And very often, you can see things that they can't begin to see. Mm -hmm. And you can see possible changes that they can't see. Mm -hmm. okay? But and, and so it puts you in a position, very often, of recommending changes that are bigger than they're willing to take on. Uh -huh. when, you, when you have that, you know, sometimes as a change agent, I say, geez, I'm here to help these people and they only want to go this far and we could go this far, you know, mm -hmm. but it doesn't do any good. If they don't believe mm -hmm. that they can change more than this amount, so to speak, 
if you try to change them more, you're going to be just too weird and they're not going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. So in that case, how, how do you go about mm -hmm. improving on, on your ability to get them to change? Because a good consultant is going to want to improve his client as much as possible. Yeah. And, and there's two limitations on that. You know, how much are they willing to change? Mm -hmm. And the first is, are they willing to accept it? Mm -hmm. okay. Once you present it, are they willing to try? Are they willing to take the next step? Are they willing to make the incremental changes? Okay. Then there's a second question, and that is, are they capable of changing? Mm -hmm. Certain cultures that are very old and very staid uh, are, not, are simply not capable of making some of these changes. And, and I can give you some examples that we would all recognize. Um, Sears and Roebuck was a company that was not able to really change. Uh, 50 years ago, they were a, a, a marketing giant. And today they're practically non-existent. Montgomery Wards was another one. And they've been replaced by a company called Amazon. Uh, yeah. And, but they had the same, the same fundamental strategy you know, they had a catalog instead of a catalog, it's an internet and they, you could buy all these things and they would ship them to you and you could pay, you know, with credit cards and all kinds of ways. Um, the U S post office is another example, mm -hmm. you know, how in the world could they have a near monopoly? And all of a sudden, you know, now the big small package carriers are FedEx and, and, um, and UPS, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, another example besides that is, um, Kodak Films. At one time, Kodak had a virtual, virtual corner of the market. And then Fuji Films came along and all of a sudden they didn't have such a big piece. And then when the digital world came along, they weren't, they weren't capable of changing. So those are examples of cultures that, that refused to change. So what I hear you saying, Lani, is two factors, as I hear you say. One is the willingness to change. Other is the capability or uh, capability to change yes exactly mm -hmm. exactly because as you want to change it's one thing to want to do it it's another thing to be capable of doing it mm -hmm. you have to change your standards you have to change your procedures you have to change where you order materials how you market how you sell and and all of those things require physical processes mm -hmm. to be changed and sometimes they're very slow to change mm -hmm. now almost always if the organization wants to, they can, okay? But there's this interaction between ability and, and, and desire. Um, and so sometimes you find out that the organization just cannot change very fast. Uh, you know, if you, if you get in a, an organization that has a lot of, of contractual work, like the government, changing the government, no matter how fast they want to change, they can only change so, so quickly because they've got so many irons in the fire okay but the 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 purpose of this article here was to talk about how as a change agent you can become more weird okay and still get things done and um and i i listed it a a a, a six-step process that you can use and, and by the way these articles are on my website they're available for anybody all you need to do is go there and you can download them and you can use them and and uh, use them as you see fit. They're they're um, uh, they're available for everybody in a word format, or you can download them in a PDF format if you'd prefer. But um, the the point of of improving your weirdness is um, when let, let me give you a, a scenario that's very typical. I'll go into a plant and I'll see that there's there's significant things that they could do, but the management is just not comfortable with it. And so we'll set some goals and objectives. And at that time, I will very often tell them, hey, we could do more. We could do this and we could do this and we could do this. And I know you're not comfortable with it. Okay. So we'll 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 stick with your, your execution plan here. But I'm going to tell you in about three months, we will probably be at this point well ahead of schedule. Mm-hmm. And that's a skill that a change agent has to have. A change agent has to be able to, to encapsulate what's going on in their culture and predict 
how quickly and how easily you can make these changes. Um, because the opposite also occurs. They might want to change everything and you got to say, time out, that's likely not going to happen. And sure. so if you're a good change agent, you're going to put some, some things in place, some checks in place. So you can say, well, I don't think that's going to work very well, but let's give it a try. And if it works very well, 30 days out, we should be at this point. Uh -huh. If it doesn't work, maybe we need to rethink it. Mm -hmm. And so you can, you can set the stage for future actions that will, in fact, improve your credibility. Mm -hmm. And then when you improve your credibility, you can be just a little more weird. <laughs> and they kind of accept it because you've, you've created a, uh, a database that they, they feel comfortable with. Um, but the, the, the worst situation gets to be when they underpredict and, 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 and you think they can do much, much more and you get out halfway through and, and then all of a sudden you find out that you can actually make more progress, but you've got to convince them, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, basically at this point, you knew earlier that they didn't have a very good plan, that you could accomplish much more. And now you've got some data to support it. So now you have to do what I call the we step, okay? And, and you've got to tell them, I told you so, without having to say, I told you so. <laughs> because if you tell anybody, I told you so, they never like that. Now give okay. me an example, how would you do that? Uh, I mean, it's a okay. thing that's straight on their face, I told you so, how do you put it? Uh, I, well, know you're, I know you're a, a good soccer coach, et cetera. And, uh, <laughs> How would you kick it like Beckham, is it? <laughs> okay, let, let, me, let me tell you, it's, it's not very difficult, really. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that you have had to set the stage earlier by telling them that you believe more was possible. Uh-huh. Okay? So you do what I call getting their fingerprints on your murder weapon. Okay? okay. <laughs> and, and your murder weapon is the new plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So instead of, you could very easily say, hey guys, back then I told you this and it's come to pass. So now are you gonna listen to me, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, all of that would be true, but you're not gonna get any support with that type of an approach. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, if you said, remember back in January when we talked about these plans mm -hmm. and we decided to do this thing, although you know we thought there might be more available. Everything is we, we, we. It's uh -huh. not me. It's not I. It's we. We thought more could be available, but we chose to do this because you were more comfortable with it. Okay. Well, now we've got some new data and we have found out that we can possibly do more. So maybe we should readdress that plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you incorporate them in the planning process. It's a little bit of a subterfuge, but it's also true. We did all of those things. Mm -hmm. But now the new plan, instead of being my plan, is our plan because we discussed it. Rani, I like this. I'm sorry to interrupt you because what's uh, what is echoing in my ears is <laughs> what you said. Get their fingerprints on your murder weapon, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that phrase. Yeah. Yes, sir. And sorry. basic, basically, yep. I mean. Very, a good change agent will know how quickly a, uh, an organization can change, how quickly their culture will adjust after working with them for, for some time. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's going to happen when the management is willing to put forth the effort to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it relies a great deal on the trust that you have uh, between yourself and the, and the key management, mm -hmm. literally, the, the, the key change agents. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so basically what you want to do, this new plan, this new murder weapon, so to speak, mm -hmm. you want to get their fingerprints on it. Mm -hmm. So the way you get their fingerprints on it is you go back and you, you articulate it in such a fashion that we talked about this and we decided on this plan. And we didn't do you know, this more aggressive plan because we didn't think it would, it would work. So, but, but now we've got some data, let's reassess our thinking, you know, let's, you know, everything is, is us. And, and they're far more likely to accept it if, if, you know, 
they, you put it in that type of a context where earlier they discussed it, you know, so it's not new to them. Mm -hmm. okay? And then if you've pre predicted it, pardon me, if you've predicted it, then, uh, then you've got some good credibility and, and very often you can make it happen. And, and if then you take off and you make more and more progress, the next time they're more likely to listen to you. Why? Because you predicted it and it came to pass and, and your credibility will improve. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it, it's not all that difficult to do, but you've got to do it in the context of, of you're there to help them and uh, it's not you coming up with ideas and them coming up with ideas. It's us coming up with ideas. It's the collective that's important more than the... the uh, Lani, uh, tell me uh, what happens, uh, as you said, uh, if uh, your weirdness is low. I mean, you just spoke to me about uh, the sweet spot, right? What happens if your weirdness is low? You get absorbed into their culture? Yes, you do. You do. You just you just become one of them, and you're not nearly as effective. Um, unfortunately, that is the position where most people, who are what we would call internal consultants, internal change agents, reside. Mm -hmm. um, now, as an as an external consultant, mm -hmm. when I come to a company, it's far easier for me to be aggressive because they almost expect that of me. Mm -hmm. That's why they hired me. You know, and also I almost always come with some credentials. You know, I could take this slide that you put up there of the books that I published and and all of a sudden I have some credibility. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't they don't know very often. They don't know me very well, mm -hmm. but I come well recommended. It's my job. I've written books. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes those are very impressive credentials to people. Mm -hmm. The internal change agent does not have that luxury. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the internal change agent maybe making recommendations to change to his boss. Yeah. The same guy who's going to determine his raise, the same guy who's going to determine his promotion, the same guy who's going to, who's going to figure out his, uh, his next assignment. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a whole lot more uncomfortable for him to, to be too weird. And so those people very often tend to be um, on, on the low end of the, the system and quite frankly, very often are not very effective change agents. And it's not their fault necessarily. It's, it's how the system that they live in works. And so it, it makes it a lot easier to be an effective, maybe not change agent really isn't the right word, but to be an effective consultant if you're external versus if you're internal to the company. Um, you have some built-in credibility. Uh, just a, uh, uh, something that occurred to me. Then how do the uh, internal cons uh, consultants, uh, internal, uh, what do you call that, change agent, uh, continuous improvement managers, and you have a lot of them, uh, really get over this impasse? Um, there, there's some some things that are just unavoidable. You know, the business culture, uh, the, the, the system of promotion and recognition and rewards, all of those things impact how the internal change agents do. But, but really, the heart and soul of it comes down to trust. Mm -hmm. Are the people who are going to need to change, do they trust the person making these recommendations? Do they trust the internal change agent? Um, if they do trust them, very often a lot can happen. But if they don't, um, it really places a burden on the change agent that maybe has none of his doing. Um, and, and trust is an, is an interesting commodity that is not very well understood. Um, when people think of trust, they think of all of these uh, admirable qualities of honesty and integrity and that. But trust goes deeper than that, it goes much deeper than that. Um, it, I like to say, you don't just trust, you trust to, you trust people to do something in particular. Um, I like to use my next door neighbor as an example, brilliant guy. He's a, he's a, a world-class accountant, um, and really intelligent. You can sit down and talk to him about all kinds of topics, 
But one of the things he is not is a mechanic. Mm -hmm. So John, my neighbor, I would trust him to watch my kids in my swimming pool, watch my kids or my grandkids. He would take good care of them. He would do what's required for their safety. But I wouldn't trust him to fix my water heater. John does not know a, a, an end wrench from a pair of water pump pliers, you know. He's got all the admirable qualities, but he doesn't have the skills to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's something you have to have if you want people to trust you. In that venue that they're trusting you to drive you to work, uh, to make a decision, to calculate the books properly, to make an engineering change, whatever it happens to be, if you want to trust them to do that, you have to believe they are competent. And in, in making changes in a lean organization, a change agent has to be very lean competent, incredibly competent, okay? Because, you know, the change agent very often makes all kinds of recommendations. And if the recommendations do not work or if they do work, they really don't play in the consequences of it, okay? But the people on the production floor do. So if, if you come up with a lousy recommendation and it doesn't work and it makes life worse for them, then they have to pay the price of that. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be very skeptical and they're going to want to make sure that you really know your stuff. You really understand lean and, and you really understand what changes and you understand their process and you understand how it's going to impact them. And so, so if you are not competent in the in the in the topic of, of discussion, you won't have their trust. And if you don't have their trust, you won't get much done. You won't get much change done. I have I have a, a, a short slide here yep. that uh, let me see if I could stop this share and and show you that. And um, this is a, a slide that I've taken. I've done all kinds of, of things with and I just pulled it up. But um, I, I like to say trust is, has, is a, is a two-dimensional metric that, that has to do with competency on the one hand, whoops, pardon me, and levels of shared values, honesty, integrity, and that type of stuff. If somebody is very competent, okay, and, but, but you don't share their values, Okay. You very likely have, have, have either fear for them or respect. Okay. If they, in fact, are not very competent and you don't have their shared values, you just plain distrust them, period. Okay. But if they have low levels of competency, but they're honest in, people with integrity, you usually have what we call affection for them. You like them as a person, but you don't necessarily trust them to you know, fix your water heater, okay? But if they have high level of competence in the field of interest and they have a, a level of shared values, then you trust them. Mm -hmm. And this plane here is what I call the pragmatic plane, okay? Yeah. Do, you have this slide? Do you have this slide? Can you share it with us? Oh, it's, oh you can't see it? No, we do, I can't see the slide. Oh, pardon me, pardon me. Son of a gun, I'm embarrassed here. No, uh, no, let me no, get no, back. No Uh, let me see. Slideshow. Okay, there. Can you see the slide? Yeah, no, yes. <clears throat> okay. Oh, yeah. Let me put it in slideshow mode. Yeah. Okay, there. Pardon me, let me go through it quickly. And th this is what I call the plane of, 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 the pragmatic plane or trust as a matter of predictability. When you trust people, you, you predict them to be able to do things. And so if, just, if they have low levels Lani, of competence. Lani, just hold on. Let me just, uh, just take a deeper look into this. Uh, what you're saying is trust in all relationships. And then we go to transformational relationship, person to person helping, transfer role and, and Okay, this matrix is uh, between a uh, level of shared values on the y-axis and competency on the x-axis. Correct. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Can I? Okay. Yes. 
and then there's there's other things in here that just kind of add noise to this slide but but when we talk about trust as as predictability mm -hmm. okay there's there's distrust where you people are the competency is low and and their their level of shared values are different than yours mm -hmm. you're honest and they're dishonest you know and um but but if you have um low levels of competency but you have a high level of shared values like talking about my friend john and fixing my water heater mm -hmm. I, i'd say you know john i I'd, I'd love to have you use it but but you don't you don't have the skills to do that so i can't trust him to fix my water heater mm -hmm. but john i know can swim and i know he's he's observant and I know he'd watch my kids. And if he was standing there by the pool, you know, and we were having a beer and I had to leave for a minute, I would trust him to watch my kids. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he has the necessary competency and we have the shared values. Mm -hmm. You know, I know he's going to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. I know he, he, he cares about that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's what I call, that's what we call transactional relationships. Yeah. Okay? There's a role to role. Yeah. Okay? And, and, um, but on the other hand, and, and that type of trust is important for a change agent. But if you really want to want people to change, mm -hmm. you have to add another issue to it. Whoa, whoa. And that is that is shared value of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to 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 share with these people um, what's really happening in the world? Let, let's say you you work on the an assembly line and you go out there and you convince them they need to change to one piece flow and somebody will say gosh i i really don't i, I really don't trust this to work you know mm -hmm. and and you can tell them well trust me i've done this a thousand times before but if on the other hand you tell them you know we've done this in other Lani, plans and what Lani, we found sorry. out is the following Lani, sorry, sorry, you, sorry sorry you implying the internal consultant right or external either. Or external consultant, right. Yes. I mean, when you say you, that means a consultant internal or external, right? Yes. Sir? Okay, sir. Okay. And the issue is, do they trust you? In order to get them to take action, they need to trust you, okay? Mm -hmm. And so what you need to express to them, you need to have a relationship with them that is based on shared vulnerability, mm -hmm. okay? If you are detached, mm -hmm. I'm the consultant, just trust me, just do it. You will get this level of trust here, what yeah. I call pragmatic trust. Okay. They may or they may not, mm -hmm. okay? But if, if you go from being detached to willing to sacrifice with them, to willing to work with them, and, and you say, listen, I know you're uneasy about this, but when we make the change, I'll be here. I'll be here with you. And if we have problems, we'll work through them. I'm willing to work with you through this. I'm willing to spend my time, effort, and energy. You know, it's not just you alone. It's you and me together. So if there's a problem, I'll sacrifice with you. Okay. And, and when you get that, you get the level of trust that I call personal, the personal trust. Okay. And it's trust as positive regard. Okay. And it's, it, it creates an emotional involvement. And they'll say, Okay, if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to spend your time, you know, we're going to do this at two in the morning. You say, mm -hmm. I'll be there. You say, okay, we'll do it. You know, be here at midnight. We'll set it up and we'll go through it. Okay. When they're willing to see that you're willing to do that, your trust has gone from just a pragmatic factor to a personal factor. They'll say, that's, okay, this, this guy is willing to go through this with me. Let's do it. That's one to one one-to-one -one sort of a relationship. Uh, yeah, and face-to-face -face and eye-to-eye -to -eye yeah. and person-to-person. -person. Mm -hmm. and, and when a consultant can do that, mm -hmm. they can go from what I call, do you see my, my mouse, uh, Dr. Yep, M? I can, yeah. They can go from being in the advising business. Uh -huh. If you want to be an advisor, this is all you need to do. That is but if you want to help, if you just, want to get just, involved in real Lani, just, just hold on, Lani. It's just for me to understand. A advising business is something that you advise and audit, right? Yeah, you just recommend. Recommend and then you come and audit. That's that you come on the uh, two dimensional figure that you have shown. That is competency and uh, level of shared values. Am I right? Right. Okay, sir. 
Okay, so you can you can be a consultant and you can advise and and in fact you can do that type of work over the internet. Mm, yeah, people can send you files. You can do analysis and, and you can come up with that. Yeah. Okay, but the type of of consulting here that I call the helping business, uh -huh. you can't do over the internet. Mm -hmm. You really can't. You've got to be there. You've got to create a working one on one, person to person, walking, talking relationship with those people. That's how you get their emotional involvement. Mm -hmm. okay? And no matter how well they understand it, if they don't believe it, if they don't care, if they don't have the em emotional engagement in it, it won't happen. It just won't happen. Would it be appropriate for me to, to say that if you have this, uh, what do you call emotional involvement, then the then the person is uh, willing to, uh, what do you say, how do you call that? Uh, willing to uh, close, close his eyes and dive into it because he trusts you? Well, no, not so much that, but he's willing to take the next step. He's willing to take the next step. Okay. He's willing to step into the unknown. Okay. Ah, I, I, I'm sorry. I couldn't. He's willing to step into the unknown and you would be holding his hand in that unknown zone am i right exactly mm -hmm. and then when you get there mm -hmm. if what you have predicted happens uh -huh. then he might say oh okay you're not such a bad guy thanks mm -hmm. and he might be willing to take the next step uh -huh. okay? but in each case along the way mm -hmm. you have to exhibit the personal skills to be competent mm -hmm. you have to exhibit the 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 personal skills to to be honest and straightforward they have to trust you on on the frontal plane mm -hmm. before they're willing to go to the to the to the rear plane so to speak and once you get there mm -hmm. if you can then develop a, a an experience based level of emotional and intellectual and physical engagement mm -hmm. then you can be an effective change agent mm -hmm. because now they'll listen to you they trust you mm -hmm. they're willing to act on what you say Mm -hmm. And and they're not willing to take you know a leap off the edge of the cliff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ah, that's they might be they might be willing to look over the edge and see what's there. Uh -huh. And when when they find what you say, they say, "Oh, okay, you know, we'll do that." Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's not a matter of getting them to just dive into the abyss. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of of them being willing to take the next step into mm -hmm. the unknown, to mm -hmm. be able to take a step out of their comfort zone mm -hmm. into the unknown. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you're there to help them and you provide the support and it works out, then they're probably willing to take the next step. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, so much of, of trust is, is starts out with competence and shared values, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it comes down to, are you willing to do this to, with me? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to put some of your skin in the game? Mm -hmm. Are you willing to, to care with me? Are you willing to, to go through the tough times with me? Mm -hmm. And uh, and then you can get into what I call the helping business. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me uh, take you across to the other end of the spectrum as uh, yeah, for the external consultant. Uh, uh, how does he avoid not getting sucked into the culture? Actually, the truth of the matter is you can't. Um, and what it is, is it, it prevents a, it presents for any culture, for any consultant, there is a, a, a limit on the time in which they can, they can truly help a company. Mm -hmm. Because as you develop these, mm -hmm. these relationships with people, they come with emotional attachment. Mm -hmm. And the thing that makes you powerful as a consultant is you can minimize that emotional attachment mm -hmm. okay when the, when the boss is telling you i don't want to change this system okay and and you have to tell him he's got an ugly baby okay <laughs> and, and his i'm sorry boss but your baby's ugly you know uh -huh. um you can only do that so often mm -hmm. but as you become closer and closer and more and more friends with him you're less likely to do that Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, and John O'Hanifan in in one of his articles about 
talking about weirdness. Mm -hmm. He says, we usually consider it the end of our useful lifetime when we start getting invited to the Christmas party. <laughs> okay. And that's his metaphor to we, we've just become absorbed into the culture and we're like one of them. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what makes you an effective consultant is that you think differently than they do. Mm -hmm. You are not like one of them. You are different. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I usually consider that, that my lifetime with the company, um, usually is, my lifespan is usually about five years. If I, if I get beyond five years with the company, um, then there's just too much that we have done together, too mm -hmm. much common ground, too much shared experience. Um, and you start to lose both your ability to observe and your detachment, mm -hmm. your technical, intellectual, and emotional detachment. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like, you know, they, 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 you've heard some things. You say a, a, a lawyer who, who uh, let me see, how does that go? Uh, a lawyer who represents himself has an idiot for a, a client. Uh, Yes, I think, yeah. a, you, you just get too emotionally involved in it and and uh you know that's why they don't want doctors to treat their their own kids yeah you know because you can't have the appropriate detachment to be um to be objective on the other hand you know you you care in a greater extent and so those things get out of balance and so you're you're right your observation is good you cannot become uh uh an external consultant for a company forever. Um, you, uh, you know, when uh, when you were discussing your book uh, of uh, enlarging your problem solving footprints, at that point of time, uh, when we, uh, we were talking, you, know, you had uh, a forum that we were discussing your book uh, uh, at the point of launch, and you would gave some example of a balloon. You remember of uh, yeah of the, yeah I I use I, that I, I forget that analogy but it's got something to do with the external consultant and the culture the best that I remember yeah. well the the I, I use the 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 analogy or the metaphor of a balloon as your culture because it's it's very very descriptive in a in a variety of ways but if you could say that your culture is a balloon okay now think you you're holding a balloon in your left hand mm -hmm. okay. And this, this balloon represents your culture, okay? Mm -hmm. When you go to change the culture, mm -hmm. it's like poking that balloon, mm -hmm. okay? And so when, when you give that balloon a poke, you see a change in the external environment localized. Mm -hmm. that, that's just what, I mean, the external shape of the, of the balloon, okay? Mm -hmm. But what you don't necessarily see is that everything else about the balloon has changed. Mm -hmm. The outside change, near the change the outside change to the balloon near the place where you poke it you can see the change mm -hmm. but what you can't see is uh other parts of it have changed maybe even just microscopically but they've changed okay and so the balloon if it's going to get back to its original shape some other things need to adjust mm -hmm. okay and if you take a balloon and you poke it and you don't let it adjust and you hold it still and you poke it again mm -hmm. and you don't let it adjust and you poke it again, pretty soon it's going to burst. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's like trying to make too big of a change in a culture. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what happens, what the cultural change agent can do is when you poke that balloon, he can not only see the local change, mm -hmm. but inside the balloon, the pressure has changed mm -hmm. inside of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. He can see that and he can see how that's impacting other organizations. Mm -hmm. Likewise, as you poke the balloon, there's some pressure on your left hand uh -huh. representing all the things that are resisting the change. Mm -hmm. So if your left hand doesn't change a little bit mm -hmm. and you keep poking, pretty soon the balloon is going to burst. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that, that hand that's resisting, it has all kinds of, of, of impacts on it mm -hmm. and it can move to the left, it can move up, it can move down, it can push back, mm -hmm. okay? And those represent the synergistic and antagonistic changes that have to happen within your culture. The problem that mo with most people 
is when you poke the balloon, metaphorically, they can see that local change. Mm -hmm. But they don't see the change that it has on training. They don't see the change that it has on the warehouse. They don't see the change that it has in material supply. They see the change at that specific place, which may be just the workstation itself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but your change agent will be able to see a lot more. That's why they need to understand lean inside out. Okay. And they also need to understand where the pressure is going to come from. You know, mm -hmm. how do you need to adjust your hands, so to speak? That's so, the weirdness, right? That's the weirdness yes. that you're talking about, right? That uh, which part of the balloon to press and what pressure to press at what point of time? That's the weirdness that you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And 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 to look at it and and uh, and to be able to predict what you need to do. You know, let's say for example, uh, in lean, you want to go to small lot production, mm -hmm. and uh, and and you went to get to the ultimate in lean is one piece flow. Mm -hmm. But very often, one piece flow is not practical because ultimately you got to take your stuff, box it up, and ship it to your customer. Okay, so you can't have one piece flow all the way through to your customer. You know. You're in Mexico and your customers in Detroit. You know you're not going to have a strain, a, a conveyor carrying one piece at a time. So you box it up and you put it in a truck. Okay. Well, as you go to one piece flow, what impact does that have on the on the business? Usually, one of the things that happens that people don't realize right off the bat is if you're going to go to smaller and smaller lot, you need more and more transportation in your system, and that may mean you need more material handlers, or it may mean you need more forklifts, or who knows what. But your, your, your change agent is going to be able to see that. And they're going to tell you, say, hey, you know, before too long, we're going to need some more forklifts. Okay, Or if your change agent is really good, he'll say, we've got forklifts on the floor. And what we want to do is we want to get to small lot production and get those forklifts off the floor. Mm -hmm. And the guy will say, we've never operated this plant ever without forklifts on the floor. How are we going to move materials around? And your change agent will be able to explain it to him. But to the person who's never seen it, that's just too weird. They just can't imagine it. And um, so those are some of the things that change agents need to know. And, and that's why they need to be so lean competent. They need to be able to predict what's going to happen next. They need to be able to explain that and articulate that. And ultimately, they need to get so people are prepared to make those changes. So a, a lot of this is 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 because you know people have never seen it before, and so when somebody else recommends it, they say, "Man, that's just too weird," you know. Uh, Lenny, I have uh, the last question for you. Uh, okay, uh, otherwise I'm <laughs> well, I'm I, I'm so interested that I'm going to speak uh, the. <laughs> I'm going to probably take a whole uh, day. I don't intend to do it. Uh, tell me, when does an internal or an external consultant get a feel that he has hit the sweet spot? Oh, uh, when you get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> as expected, as weird as possible. Yeah, tell us. Well, like, for example, I... I uh, I, I was working with a company and it was in the first year and I hadn't quite yet figured out how weird they were willing to accept. And um, they had an annual Kaizen conference. Mm -hmm. And at the Kaizen conference, I was the keynote speaker mm -hmm. and I made a presentation on a topic and I said, you got to learn to love problems. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's kind of a lean principle that you know, problems are opportunities to improve. Anybody who's been involved in lean knows that, okay? But people who are not involved in lean very often try to avoid problems. Mm -hmm. Problems are a pain in the neck. We got to do this. We got to do that. We got to jump through hoops. And they don't see it so much as an opportunity to improve. They see it as a nuisance. Mm -hmm. And they would like to avoid problems, okay? So I made this presentation. You got to learn to love problems. And, and at the end of it, um, uh, I, I got this signal that was just unmistakable. Uh, this was a, a high level conference. So the CEO was there, all the division managers, um, 
up to and including plant managers. All the plant managers were there. And they had 66 plants worldwide. So there were there were plant managers for Hungary, from China, from Mexico, from Canada, the United States, all around the world. And I would bet at least 10 or 12 plant managers came up to me and said, Wilson, that was just great. You know, we need to, <laughs> we need to have more of this. But the chief financial officer uh -huh. came up to me and he got me aside and said, you know, Lonnie, we want you to, you know, push us and that type of stuff. But, you know, I, after this talk, he said, I think I'm going to go check your pockets for funny little cigarettes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> implementing that I've been smoking weed or something. And it was just a little bit crazy. I mean, it was too far for them. They couldn't accept it. They couldn't accept the fact that you got to learn to love problems. And um, I knew I had gone too far. Okay. And so, so luckily the chief financial officer didn't have uh, wasn't, wasn't there to fire me or anything like that, but I knew I'd pushed him too hard and I needed to back off a little bit. And um, the, the way you find that out is you keep the lines of communication open with the, the key people. And almost always there's, there's two or three people who are absolutely instrumental. The whole people, the whole group of people in the C-suite might be eight or 10 people. You might have the IT manager, the, the chief financial officer, the chief operating officer, the head of HR, all of those organizations might be there, but there's one or two or three who are really in the, what you'd call them the senior leadership positions or the, the most influential people. And so I always keep an ongoing relationship, pardon me, going with them and, and, and an open, what I call open, honest, fact-based, pardon me, open, honest, facts-based dialogue with them. And then I, I, every time I'm done talking to them, I go through a reflection on it. What did I learn from this? Have they given me clues that we're pushing too hard? Have they given me clues that we're not pushing hard enough? Mm -hmm. And um, so by keeping those lines of communication open, I can, I can discern whether I've pushed hard enough or not hard enough. And- uh, uh, I think I should now do the hensai and reflect on all what we talked. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And it was very interesting uh, conversation. And we're going to extend it further in uh, further episodes. And thank you very much for being here. And uh, I'm going to do a hensai. <laughs> I don't know when I'm going to sleep, but I'm going to do a hensai on what you said. I love these three dimensional figures that you said. And well, this, is, said, this has been extremely enjoyable to me too, Dr. M. I, I appreciate the time. I appreciate the opportunity to share this with, with your audience. And um, I'm hoping we can do it again. Sure. I'm not going to leave you alone in Texas in El Paso. I'm going to come there. And what, what do you do with the horses with that loop? Uh, you, I used to see, what are they called? You know, the cowboys used to do that. With a loop. Oh, you mean uh, corral the horses or yeah, you lasso do that the and, uh, yeah, bring them back, isn't it? So, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna do that. I'm not you very know, good at that. I'm, I'm gonna. We don't have back. any horses, but there's no, there's no, plenty I'm, of their neighbors. Pardon me. I say we don't have any horses, but where we live in El Paso, mm -hmm. uh, our neighbors have horses. We live in an area that's pretty rural, so oh, they, 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 horses I around see, here. So see, we'll yes. we'll sign you up with somebody so you can go out and and practice your, your horsemanship. <laughs> <laughs> so you are going to come back and we are going to have some more discussion on this. Love to be uh, with you. And uh, thanks a lot, Lenny. Thanks a well, lot. Good. I hope this has been helpful for those thanks people who want to be Stay changing blessed. agents in the future. Stay so. blessed. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. You have a good day. Yep. Get, go get some sleep. It's pretty late there. <laughs> you know, it's pretty early in the morning on Thursday. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Just Thank you, Dr. M. You have a good day. Just one minute. Just one minute. Because there's something happening.